Thanks to Brother Larry for that prayer. If you haven't got one of these papers in the back yet, you're more than welcome to get one. I don't do PowerPoints. I like to make it a little more personal and give you a place for notes. And I hope that you will open your Bibles and follow along and take notes. That's kind of the whole part of the reason we do that. So please feel free to do that. You see in the pre-study of the, of the lesson tonight, it asks a question. And I want you to answer this and try to do the best you can with it and take some time. It's okay. What is the most important advice you could give someone? Think about that for a second. What is the most important advice you could give someone, be they young or old? Think of this as the last thing you ever tell someone, your last words. I put that in quotations. What would it be and why? Think about that for a second. If you had just five or six words, what would you tell people? Lots of different things. Please feel free to write that down as we go through this lesson. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Your last words, my last words, the last words a person says. There's so much importance put on last words in our society. If you follow along with my writing there in the study, it says, I have been curiously interested in a person's last words seemingly my entire life. They're very interesting. You look up last words of people, there's some very captivating things. There just seems to be something to the final thing you hear a person say. Maybe it's because we're all looking for some insight into what is about to come next for someone who's knocking on death's door. Or maybe it's because it shows the frailness of life, the suddenness of how quickly it all can end, and it helps us appreciate our existence a little more. Whatever it may be, last words from famous and not-so-famous people have been chronicled throughout history. Some are very comical. Oscar Wilde, we got to study about him a little bit. We were over in Ireland this summer, some of us, and he's a strange guy, a little bit eccentric. Uh, they said he was the very first reality star. That's basically, if you can think of that. He said, this wallpaper is terrible. One of us will have to go. And I guess we know who left. Uh, the wallpaper probably lived out longer than... Oscar Wilde. Some are strange. Did you know Walt Disney and the genius that he is creatively? I mean, there's a lot. I'm a creative person. You aspire to be Walt Disney with his business acumen and, of course, his creativity was off the charts. But you think, oh, his last words, they have to be something you know, just ingenious and creative, right? He literally wrote on a piece of paper the words Kurt Russell. For those of you who don't know, Kurt Russell was Austin said, who's Kurt Russell? He was a child actor at that time. He ended up becoming a, 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 a man, and he became an actor who was pretty famous for a while. He's married to some celebrity or whatever. But it's funny that his last words were Kurt Russell. And sometimes words are just flat out inspiring. I remember watching the news about 2007 is when it was, and I was, uh, I think that I was living at home, or I might have been living away from home at that time, but I was at home for some reason, mom and dad's, and I saw a thing come on the news, and it was this, uh, this news, I really don't like the news at all, if you know me at all, you know I don't even like watching it, but it was a, a preview of something, this guy was giving a speech, and, and I saw this man with such vigor and vitality for living, I was just absolutely amazed by this guy. His name was Randy Posh, if you might know him, uh, Dr. Posh. Yeah, he was a very creative guy himself. I ended up becoming a Disney Imagineer for a little bit and things like that. But he was giving this speech. And then the thing that caught my attention and why I researched it even more, it was called The Last Lecture. And what Carnegie Mellon University is a very uh, great institution up in, in Pittsburgh. They do a lot of interesting things. One of the things they do is they give professors the assignment of, uh, they'll ask a professor once a year, hey, would, would you give your last lecture. And what this is, is an assignment for these professors, if they accept it, is if you had the last lecture, your last class ever, what would you tell people in this last lecture? Well, Dr. Posh, after he had uh, accepted this assignment, a few months later, he was diagnosed with metastasized pancreatic cancer, something for him that was completely incurable. And so this theoretical assignment that he had actually became a reality. This was his last lecture he was going to give. And so when he got up there, he, he gave a, a big speech. And at the very end of it, he said one thing. The conclusion on his, the matter of living, the last thing he said in his whole speech, he said, it's not about achieving your dreams, which is what his speech was about. 
It's about how you lead your life. If you lead your life the right way, the karma will take care of itself. The dreams will come to you. I thought that was very interesting. And then the very, very last thing he said, he said he had two head fakes. That was one head fake. This, this whole speech about living your dreams is actually about how to live your life, he said. But the other one was what you see there. This talk is not for you. It's for my kids. A lot of people told him, you don't have to do this assignment. You don't have to really go up and give your last lecture, Randy. You don't have to do this. You're actually going through a lot. He was moving his family to Virginia from Pittsburgh so that they could have be near family when he died. He was preparing for life after death even when he was alive. Very strange to think about. He said, you don't have to do it. But he said, I want to do it. And that's why you see why he did it. He wanted to leave a peace for his family. Now, I'm not too familiar with Randy's religious background. I did look up some things, and he was religious of some sort. But he believed it was a personal thing, a personal journey. But at the end of Randy's life, no matter his religious background or not, he knew two very clear things, which I think we'll all know if we have enough time to think about. Live your life right and the importance of the legacy we leave behind. Today we're going to explore those things. Are you living your life right? And what legacy are you leaving behind? Too often we see so many of our young people, I think about the kids that I've been fortunate enough to teach us in this class over here, the teenage class. I think I've been teaching the teenage and middle school class since I was like 18 or 19 years old. And the kids that don't even come to church anymore. So many. So many of them. Where are we going wrong in that, folks? Where are we going wrong in that? It's not a God problem. It's an us problem. Look at the first point there. And I kind of just made some famous words or points because they went along with the points. And you see Ludwig von Beethoven, or whatever, however you say it. I'm sure some snobby person says, oh, he's saying that completely wrong, and I probably am. But is what I know it as. His last words supposedly were, applaud my friends, the comedy is over. I love those. Those are great words. His last words, applaud my friends, the comedy is over. What does he mean by this kind of interesting, vague reference here? What he means is find the humor in life. And if this was my last speech, if this is the last thing I ever say, I will tell you find the humor in life. Because life is tough. Life can be so, so very difficult. I was talking to Brother Ed the other day at his house fire and he said, sometimes you just got to laugh. It's almost comical, isn't it? It's not mean that in a mean way at all. To have a house catch fire two times and to lose everything, you just have to sit there and go, how on earth does this happen? And we talked about Job and how Job has all this stuff he loses and how he thinks about it. Let's look at Luke 6.21. And you see all the verses are listed there so you can follow along. Luke 6, 21, it says, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. I used to think as a kid that there was a time in a Christian's life when you would just be at a high, a constant high, an exhilarating life, and you would stay there for the rest of your life. If you were living your Christian life right, you would keep at this high for the rest of your life. And as long as you didn't falter at all, you would be right there. Well, it's kind of stupid as a kid, evidently, because the Bible does not talk about there's going to be this high in life when you are just invincible and everything is going perfectly great at all times. The Bible and every religion in the history of mankind that I could ever find and have studied preaches one thing, and they all get it from the Bible and God. Balance. Find balance. You hear like in, in uh, yoga, you ever think, find your center. Find your balance. That's what life is about. When the highs are high, realize that they'll go away. Enjoy them as much as you can, but don't dwell on that. When the lows are low, don't dwell on those, because guess what? What does it say in, right there in Luke? You shall laugh again. Let's look at Psalms 126, 2 through 3. It says, Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with joyful shouting. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord, listen to this last part, has done great things for us. We are glad. Use an example of another place. They were happy. I came in today and it was just like one smile can just set up a whole spark, doesn't it? Little McKenna's smile, just a kid smiling. 
For some, I mean, there's a lot of things happened this week. Sister Ruth passed away, of course, Ed and Murray's house and things like that. It was tough to sit here today and just feel how sorry you were for people. The Orlando shootings and things that happened there and that sad situation. It just seems like every time you watch the news, something's bad happened. The alligator that ate that poor little kid and things like that. It just makes you toss and turn. I, 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 I could not sleep at all. Just, I, I usually have a, an easy time sleeping. All these things are on my mind so much, and I'm sure you guys were very much like that. So many bad things are happening in the world. What can you do? You have to realize that God has done great things for you. And just because there are bad things that happen in the world does not mean that God does not continue to do great things for us. Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up bones. Be that infectious person. Be that person who smiles, who laughs, who enjoys coming to church. Your children are watching that. People are watching all around you. Brother Chuck posted something on Facebook today about that from Brother Ed's lesson. Ignite a fire in people. When you come in, do not be a downer. Be an optimist. Look at things and see how you can help and be an infectious person with your smile. I'm telling you right now, if you're a down person, you will be infectious in the wrong way. Don't be that way. We're very blessed. In Job 8.21, his Bill Dad, the Shuite, his friend tells him here, after Job has lost his family, he's lost his livelihood, he's lost everything. He's got these, this leprosy, these boils or whatever, all over him from head to toe. He is a terrible mess. And so many of his friends are giving him bad advice. And Bill Dad, the Shuite, says in 8.21, He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. In the next chapter, you see Job say, I agree with you, and I know that is right. Job understood, and that's what got Job through these hard situations, is that he knew that God, even though this was a bad situation, eventually he would laugh again. Eventually he would find some joy in life. You know where that joy comes from, God? From God. It comes from God. Without God in your life, you will have a very, very difficult time of finding that joy. I think about a comical story. When I was a kid, we had a dog, and I might have told some of you this story before, but we were coming home from church. I remember we had one of those old station wagons. My grandma, Sam's, was riding with us. I think we were going to Winding Road at the time. She had a black dog. We called it Red. I don't, it was weird. I don't know why we did that. But we were coming up the hill, and uh, we were sitting in the back, and we felt a bump on our hill there, and I was like, you hit Red, Mom and Dad. No, 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 we didn't. We didn't hit the dog. We came home from school the next day thinking nothing of it, and Mom sat us down, and she said, Kids, I have to tell you something. And we said, What's going on? Laura and Paula and I are sitting there. She said, You know, last night when you said that we hit red, and we said, No, 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 we didn't. We did. Uh, we hit red, and he died. Uh, Laura, as weird as she is, started crying and ran to the woods. Something better like that. She ran to the woods, and uh, and that was strange enough. And you know, mom looked at us and said, as we're crying in tears, she says, do you want to go to McDonald's? And of course, Paul, I always loved McDonald's. Was like, yeah, it was completely done with it. I was kind of still like, yeah, I like when McDonald's is, it was good. Well, years later, we had a dog. We had a dog for so many years. She was a great dog named Sparky. And what a blessing she was. She was just a, a great friend and, and a, a great animal. And she ended up passing away from cancer. Mom and I went to the vet and Mary at Ohio there, and we went to put her to sleep. And what a terrible thing to put an animal to sleep. It's just so sad, especially a good friend of yours. And as she goes to sleep, I, you know, just really just goes to sleep. And, you know, we're just crying in the car. She's in the back. We're going to take her back to my grandma's where she loves so much in that farm. We're going to plant a tree for her. It's real nice thing. And mom's crying, and I'm crying. And as we're driving along, and this is 15, 16 years later, mind you, I looked at mom as she's crying, and I said, you want to go to McDonald's? <laughs> we laughed about that, and even though we still cried and it was still tough, and it wasn't trying to make light of the situation. It was just realizing that God had blessed us with these years with this dog, with these years with this person. Look on the blessings of life as opposed to the cursings of it. Jesus realized humor, even in some of the physically tough occasions. I don't think people realize Jesus' humor. Yeah, there's sometimes we're like, oh, the, the eye of, you know, it's easier for, you know, for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle. And they're like, isn't that hilarious? Most of us are like, I don't understand it really. It's not really that funny to us. 
But you, if you really understand Jesus' dry sense of humor and how funny he was, look at, look at this verse with me. This is the longest one we'll read, but Luke 24, 33 through 43. Watch his humor. And it says in verse 33, And they got up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Can you believe? They, it's happened, folks. He said it was going to it happen. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of their bread. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Very weird situation. They're talking. Could you believe he came back? He really did it. And he's just like, hey, guys. That's shocking to folks. Okay, he literally rose from the dead, folks. That's just shocking if you don't understand that. But they were all startled and frightened, wouldn't you be? And thought they were seeing a spirit. This is a ghost. This can't be true. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do your doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as I have. He says, look, I have the holes in my flesh where they cut my side open. Folks, if he's alive again, guess what? That's probably pretty painful. We don't think about that. But he has literally holes in his flesh. And it was fresh, folks. It's not like he was just sitting there scabbed over. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Why they still, now here's the joke, could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. They were in shock and joy and amazement. Watch what Jesus says. He said to them, have you anything to eat here? They're, they're shocked over all these things. And he just looks at me, hey guys, do you have any food? Like, I'm really hungry. I literally died. Um, I would really like some fish. It's very comical to think about Jesus finding humor in this, you know, when they're absolutely amazed that this happened, and Jesus still finds humor. Still, your humor and activities should, that could produce humor should be decent and pleasing to the Lord. Don't just go out and make jokes light of things that are, are ridiculous and stuff. This has been a tough thing for me to learn. Ephesians 5 and 4, And there must be no filthiness and silly talk, of course, jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Your talk and your speech and the jokes that you do. I love when Wayne posts little animal things on his camel's pet grooming things on Facebook. I always show him the channel and laugh because Wayne's comments are always so funny about it. You just, love, just, you just knowing Wayne and he talks about this cute little fluffy puppy or whatever. You know, Wayne, Wayne's this guy and he's like, this cute little fluffy puppy. He just makes me laugh because he's such, he loves animals so much and he's just such a tender heart. It's just such a joyous thing to see. Same thing with us, folks. We don't have to go into dirty, filthy talk. One of the things I always learned about stand-up comedy is when you say a cuss word, people automatically think it's funny. You know why? Because when you're a kid, you're told, do not cuss, do not, well, unless you're in today's society and they think it's funny to teach kids to cuss, but do not cuss, do not cuss, do not cuss. In class, we're told, do not swear, do not swear, do not swear. Why do people think it's funny? Because you're told, do not do it. So the easy thing to do, and I'll tell you, no stand-up comedian had respect for people who just got up there and cussed because there was no originality to it. There's no depth to that comedy. Why? Because it takes no talent to make a swear word. They say that people who cuss are too unintelligent to think of a word to replace it. So that's why they do that. Very interesting thing to think about. Let's look at point two here on the back. This is my favorite one, I think. This is my favorite last words ever. King Louis, he said... <coughs> His last words supposedly were, Why do you weep? Did you think I was immortal? Something to think about, isn't it? Don't we all put off death? Don't we all sit there and think, Oh, you know, death's never going to happen to us. It's never going to happen to us. It can happen to everybody else, but it's not going to happen to us. Why do we think that? Because I've always known the world as I'm in it, right? I can't imagine a world without me because I've only known the world with me. That's very close-minded, folks. Because the world will go on without us. It's hard to believe, but think about loved ones who have passed away. Guess what? The world goes on. I always told Dad about retirement. I said, guess what? Your company doesn't really care about you. When you are done, which he finished up last Friday, Dad, did the whole company shut down? No, it did not. They went on. They replaced them with four people, which is crazy to think about. But the company went on. The world will go on. The world does not stop when we pass away, folks. The world goes on. It does not matter how big of an impact you have or how little of an impact you have. 
the world will continue until God wants it to be done. Don't take any moment or person for granted. I think this is something I try so hard to live my life by. I try so hard to be in the now, in the moment with people. When I have a conversation with people, I try to be in that moment. I don't always succeed, but I try very hard. Because I know how important it is for friends to talk and to have conversation. Let's look at Psalms 118.24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Every day they say, the greatest thing about the present is what? It's a gift from God. The present, get it, it's kind of a pun. But it's one of those things where it's very real. You are in church right now. Be in church. If you have your cell phones, why in the world is it going off in church? If people know you're in church, they don't need to text you. They don't need to call you. Well, it might be an emergency. That's one thing. But any other time, I used to sit there and my phone would go off. I get text messages. You know what I did? As soon as it vibrate, I look at it. Oh, that's response. Guess what I did? Detracted from my worship. So now, even though I use my Bible on my phone, I put it on airplane mode so it does not ring. You know what I found is that nothing is that important. The problems that happen during church are going to be there when I get out of it. I need to focus on God more. We need to take time more. What do people meditate for? It talks about that in the Bible, praying. When's the last time you actually prayed and really meditated on God? When's the last time you read the Bible and meditated? We do not meditate on things enough. We do not think about God enough in our daily life. When you pray, don't keep the TV on. That's a bad habit, isn't it? People go, oh, I just need to say a prayer real quick before I eat. You keep the TV on, things like anything that's a distraction from God takes away from God. Get rid of those. Have moments with God. Ephesians 5, 15-16, it says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as, what? Wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Make the most of your time and that's how you do it. Taking moments for God. 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for uh, those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Provide for your family. That does not just mean food and water and shelter. One of the things you need is an emotional tie. It's Father's Day today. We observe Father's Day, right? What kind of a father are you? What kind of a mother are you? What kind of a son? What kind of a daughter are you? Are you one that is atypical? The, the, is it one that is absolutely outstanding? Or are you one that is always taking from your family? Taking from your family. And parents, when that kid is taking from you and taking from you, what are you doing to stop that? Are you letting them just walk all over you as it happens too much? Now you sit there and go, Nathan, you don't understand. You don't have kids. I don't know if you know this, but I'm a pretty observant person. I know I don't have kids, and I know it will be a lot different when I have kids. But I can watch things as Jesus did. Jesus didn't have kids. I don't know if you knew that. And Jesus taught on children. So when you sit there and say, oh, you don't have kids, you don't know. Look at Jesus. Well, you don't ever married. Jesus was never married. I'm not sure if you knew that either. And he taught on that as well. Lemony Snicket is kind of a children's book, but they write, I like this verse. It's a curious thing, the death of a loved one. We've all lost one, sadly. We all know that our time in this world is limited, but, and that eventually all of us will end up underneath some sheet, never to wake up. And yet it is always a surprise when it happens to someone we know. It's like walking up the stairs to your bedroom in the dark and thinking there is one more stair than there is. Your foot falls down through the air and there is a sickly moment of dark surprise as you try to readjust the way you thought of things. I think about my grandparents quite often and I'm sure you can name a lot of people with you. I have my granddad's phone number still on my phone. He's been dead for about four years. Why? I just don't want to delete it. And don't we do that? Sometimes to a fault where we don't want to get rid of something so much that we do not change our life for God. How many funerals I've been to where families are not coming to church and the patriarch of that family, the mother or the father, have been a faithful Christian and the people are crying and weeping and saying, I wish, I wish, I wish I'm going to go back to church. I'm going to make my life right. And they might, might 
come one time. They never learn. And they're dissatisfied with life. And you wonder why. Because they're not following God. Say the things you want to say now. We have a tough time telling people we love them. Why? I love you. Say that. I love all of you. Well, it's easy for you to say. You're just shouting, Nathan. I sincerely love all of you. It is so tough for me to ever leave here because you are my family. I could have taken five billion jobs in some different places and been a completely different world. But I love my family here at this church. And I fight for my family at this church as you fight for me. And you love me. And I appreciate that so much. And I don't care if I make a trillion dollars in life. As long as I can give to the people that I care about, and they give to me, and we get to heaven together, that's what it's all about. Tell people you love them. Tell them when they did a good job. What's wrong with saying, hey, you did a great job. That. Hey, I like your shirt. Hey, uh, that's such a great laugh. I love your laugh. Why is so wrong with that, folks? Give a person a hug. Give a person just a pat on the back. Give them a handshake. Don't be afraid of people. Don't be like the rich man and wait too long. Look at Luke 16, 27 through 29. The rich man, of course... When he feed Lazarus and he dies, and what's it say there in Luke 26 or 16, 27? And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. He says, Please, I don't want my brothers to come here. I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so they do not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. When you die, you do not come back. You might think, oh, there goes this. I'm going to become a ghost. I can come back. I'll be an angel. Well, it is not in the Bible. When you die, you do not come back. Say the things you need to say now. Do not wait. It doesn't matter if you leave here tonight. You call your daughter, your, your, your son, your, your mother, your father, your husband. Your, your, go and hug them. Tell them you love them and sincerely mean it. Have a conversation with them. Shut the phone off. Shut the internet off. Turn Facebook away. Delete the dumb thing for all I care. It's nothing but a waste. Do something for people. Put humanity back into our world. Put humanity back into our church. Because we have lost it, folks. We do not care enough. We can never care enough. <laughs> I'll give you a very personal example of this. The other day, Patience was so nice. She made dinner for everybody. And she invited her mom. She invited everybody she knew, I think, in the world. And they all came. They came and she made a very good meal. And it was very nice of her to do. And we come out there. And, and, and I, I, I was with Shannon and our friend Megan and my dad. And I said, let's play a game. I, was, I want to play a board game. And just want to kind of have some time with my dad. And dad kept saying, I want to play cornhole. I want to play cornhole. And I was like, oh, you should play cornhole because you're good at cornhole. And that's just what I <coughs> Beat us at cornhole. So we set up cornhole because, again, you, when you love somebody, you give and take, right? So I gave, and I gave in, and I'm going to play cornhole, and got my butt beat in, in cornhole. But as we're sitting there, my sister, who we all know is kind of a little bit different, and I still love very much, and she didn't really talk to anybody, truthfully, at, at all in our family, and then she left with her boyfriend, and my dad was going in, and I'll never forget this, and he might get embarrassed for me saying it, but I don't really care. Sorry, Dad. He said... I thought they would play cornhole, at least with us. My dad cares enough about my sister, still. After all the heartache and after all the stupidity that she's caused in our family for years and years and years, and she continues to do, my dad still loves her enough. I want to play a stupid, simple game with her. And she won't even do that. We all have a family member like that, right? Will she ever learn? No, Laura's going to be one of those people, sadly, at, at, when Dad dies or when we die. It says, I wish, I wish, I wish, because she does it now. Stop wishing and start doing. We'll go forward with life. But that same love that my dad exhibited with my sister, imagine that love times a billion that God gives for you. And he sets things up for us, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives. And he says, oh, man, I really wish Nathan would just stop this. I really wish Nathan would just love me and forget all this other stupid stuff. And I let him down. We all let him down.
Don't live in the past or the future. Live for now. Look at Isaiah 43 and 18. It says, Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Do not worry about things in the past. We sit there and go, Oh, I can't, if I had done this differently, my, my, this would have been different. Stop it. You can't change it. You can't change it. It doesn't matter now. You've got to drop it, folks. You can't dwell in the past. Don't dwell in the future. What's it say? Matthew 6, 34, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen to that. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. What can you do today to invoke change in this world because you might not have tomorrow? What I say? Say the things you need to say now. Even if they get mad at you and hate your guts, it doesn't matter. Because when they grow up and realize that you really did care about them, it will sadly be a shocking thing. Life is too short. Look at Matthew, or James 4.14. 4, yet, you, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You were just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Oh, no, no, Nathan, you don't understand. I'm pretty important. Pretty important. No. It doesn't matter if you're the king, of, the biggest king in the world, if you're Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or any of these people who think they're so, so important, and all these politicians think they're important. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of your life, you're going to be, end up just like all the rest of us. Well, then why do I even try, Nathan? If it doesn't matter, why does... Because... What matters is giving to God, preparing for life afterwards. This life is short. Eternity is a long time. Spend it wisely. Look in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments. Because this applies to every single person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. You cannot hide from God. I have this sin no one knows about. No one knows about. I just don't want to tell anybody. I'll never tell anybody. Why? It doesn't matter, folks. You're not hiding it from anybody. God knows about it. Imagine everybody knows about it because God knows about it. Once he knows about it, it doesn't really matter. And if people judge you for a sin, I've heard people go, oh, well, so-and-so, you know, they, 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 they won't accept this brother because they were in prison or they were doing this or they had done drugs in their past and they can't get over that. Get over it. What do you think? Paul killed people. If you can't get over some of those little stupid things that we sit there and have such a hold-up on, get over it. It is not your right to judge people. It is not my right to judge people. That's God's right and God's right only. And if you have a big problem with that, you have to fix you. God does not have to conform to your mentality. Death, though an ending, is also a beginning. Look at Mark 12 and 27. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. He is not the God of the dead. Yes, you will die. I like this analogy my dad gave me the other day. He said, just like a seed of corn, when planted in the ground, it turns into something completely different. When you plant a seed of corn in, you don't just get a bunch of seeds of corn. It just start popping out like it's a, a, like a gusher of some sort. You know? That doesn't make any sense. It comes out this beautiful stuff. And it comes out even prettier and more fruitful than that little seed of corn, does it not? Imagine your life is the exact same way. It is pretty much just a just little in a shell. You put it in the ground, and guess what? beautiful thing comes after. Stop focusing on, on this life. I don't know why we do that. They're, they're, it's like we're on a ship. Our soul is in the ship. Our body is this vessel. We're going across the ocean. I love this little uh, little story from Tuesdays with Maury, which we're finishing our little book club. And I'm uh, glad, glad people humored me and came to that. I appreciate that. But uh, there's a story. It goes, there's a little wave, and it's bouncing around. It's so happy. This, 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 this female wave is just so happy. And this male wave comes up to it, and it, and it says, why are you so happy? Don't you realize you're going to hit the side of the, the, the shore, and you're going to be nothing? And the little wave that looks at the other wave and says, don't you realize? I'm not just a little wave. I'm a part of the ocean. The things you do in your life have grander repercussions than you can ever imagine. 
being a good father, like Dwight and Nicole, a, a, a good uh, mother, trying to raise a child right. And people like that who are trying so hard. Don't you root for people like that? Not to call them out, but you root for people like that because they're trying so hard. You want them to succeed. When you try, people root for you. They want you to win. Look at the Olympics. How many people are going to do the same thing with the Olympics? Here's the other thing about that. If you don't do what's right, what does God utterly do? In the Old Testament, God does not change. People think, oh, God changed. He changed from the Old Testament. He did not. What did he do to his enemies? Sometimes it felt cruel. He killed the babies. He killed the mothers. He killed everything. He utterly destroyed everything. That what? Opposed him. God has no secret. What's it say in the Bible? He is a jealous God. Do you think he will not destroy sin or those who are against him? God has always destroyed those who are against him. Always. And it's been utterly destructive. Oh, he's going to forgive me. As soon as I get to heaven, I'll just walk up like, listen, I had some things going on. It doesn't matter, folks. It doesn't matter. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, And if... And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution, not a great word, is it, to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. What's it say in verse 9? These will pay the penalty, another not so great word, of eternal destruction. Not a great word again away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. But that's not why Jesus came to earth. He did not come when people go, oh, I don't want to go to church. All he wants to do is punish me. No, why did Jesus come to earth? You see in John 10 and 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's not God. I came, they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came and sacrificed himself that we may have abundant life. Absolutely amazing. We can't grasp that even, but we have to try. Not that I'm, my favorite person in the world is not Karl Marx. I did quote him on here, but uh, he was probably not the wisest man in the world, I would say. But I did like his last words, which kind of went around with his personality a little bit. He says, go on, get out. Last words are for fools who haven't said enough. I totally agree with that, though. Your life is your last words, folks. The way you live your life... So 99% of us aren't going to have last words. We'll die before we even know it. And our last words will be as stupid as Walt Disney or Kurt Russell. What does that mean? Who cares? It's just dumb. He said a lot of other important things in his life. What kind of legacy are you leaving behind? That's the question. 2 Timothy 2 and 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Psalms 145.4 One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. The things you do, the things you're teaching people, that results in the next generation that comes about. Guess what? That next generation is never very far off. They're just little right now, aren't they? But guess what? They'll grow up very quick. Anybody who's had kids knows that people grow up pretty quick. Look how tall Lydia is getting already. I can't believe how tall she is. I can't believe patience is almost an adult. My goodness. It's crazy to think about. Those are just people in my family. Think about your family and how quickly they grow up. And it's not just you coming to church and filling a pew and being here and warming it. It's actually living it. Your last words are, go to church. There's so much more to that. Go to church? That's our last words. Our last words should be live. Live Christianity. Every single moment you have, live for who? God. Because that's what the Bible says. It doesn't say, hey, just take a time out. You know, take some time to yourself. Go off. What we tell kids when they go to college? This is all about you right now. That's the stupidest thing you can ever tell a kid to go to college. Because they really, truly think it's all about them. I know I was in that situation. It's all about you. This is you time. Oh, this is, my, this is me time. This is... Okay. Never is it you time. It's always God's time. Nothing is impossible with God. You know, they say even with the faith of a mustard seed, what can you do? Move a mountain. Oh, that's just, that's just an analogy, Nathan. You can't really move a mountain. If Jesus and God say it, then it is true. 
Nothing is impossible. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future of hope. Proverbs 69 says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord does what? Directs his steps. And Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'll give you for an example, last little story. When I was a kid, I loved football. I loved football probably as, as more than anything I, 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 at that time when I was a kid. I wanted to be a pro football player so bad. Like, I just thought it was so cool. And so I was not that good or anything like that. But I, I played for Brooke, who thinks they are way better than they really are. And we had a JV year. It was our junior year. We, we had a fun time. We, that was really great. And we got on the game of the week. It was against um, Buckeye Local down there in Ohio. And we got blown out. We ended up going 2-8, and eight, one of the worst years in Brooke High School history. <laughs> won the first two games and lost the last eight. And the, and the varsity was just horrible. They were really terrible and just fooled themselves still. They all thought they were going pro. And so we get in there and we get sort of in the game. I remember I had candy in my sock on the sidelines because we, we were like, we're not going to ever get in. So we need candy in our sock is what we do. And it kind of sounds disgusting, but it was wrapped up. Right? And we'd say, put me in, coach, by John Fogel and things like that. Like that, and we never get in. But anyway, we're getting blown out and all of a sudden, uh, the coach, head coach looks around and he says, JV, you're going in. Oh, goodness, our hearts start coming a little bit harder. Right? And we got in there and we got in the huddle and we all looked around and here's this band of brothers. You know, you're, you're, the people you fight with at your church. The people you fight with, you could all get into the spot. And you have a moment where we go, oh my goodness, like, we're in the game. That's hard to believe. Like, we're nervous and excited. We didn't care about anything. We were just excited to get in, right? And we ran a couple plays, and then we were done. We walked out, and they went to punt the ball. Well, they punted the ball, and the next thing you know, the guy fumbled the ball, and we recovered the ball. Go back in. Oh, my goodness. And not only go in, they pulled me aside. Nathan, we're going to pass the ball. I'm a receiver. I'm like, Brooke doesn't pass the ball. You know anything about Brooke football? You're on the ball all the time. We're going to pass the ball. We go in, and tell the quarterback, Mike Williams, remember his name? So Mike is over running. He's like, oh, are you going to be serious? I said, yeah. So I go out, and I line up there, nervous as could be, and take off, and I turn to the side, and I fake, and the kid, this little kid, just bites on it, and I just take off running. That's not the end of the story. And I said, well, as I'm running, I'm like, okay, that's cool. I'm running. I, I, everything's slow motion, right? I'm running a pass right this. And all of a sudden, I see the ball in the air. And it's like almost one of those moments where, and I think you probably had them in life, you could just step out and like kind of look at your body and just go, there's a ball in the air. It, that ball is coming to me. Everything was just like slow. And, and I think in my head, this all goes on in a matter of like 0.1 seconds, but it feels like an eternity. Nathan, you can't catch that. It's too far. It's good enough you were in the game and a ball was thrown your way. You can't catch that. You have to have something as a Christian inside your head when those moments come up that say, no, I don't want to sin. I don't want to believe that this is it for me. And I looked at that, and I, something came over me and says, no, you're going to catch this ball. I don't know where it came from. I'm like, I have no clue. I mean, it's like some funky chicken or something. I don't know. But it, it came because I had had this desire for my whole life. To be in a game and to catch a touchdown to me, as dumb as it sounds, was a huge moment in my young life. And I had prepared for that moment mentally for so long. I had replayed it over and over and over in my head. And so when that ball was in the air, I didn't think, nope, you're right, I can't catch it. I ran faster and harder. And I put my arms out as far as I can. And if you want to see the tape, we do have a tape. It's real. This is <laughs> And I felt the ball in my hands. And somebody hit my legs from behind. And I landed. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I looked down, and I had caught the ball. And I look up, and this referee goes, touchdown. I just got a 50-yard touchdown. I never in my life at that moment been so excited. And all the team and all of these guys we'd worked so far, hard for came up and like, ripped me apart. Brian Fish, I remember, he almost ripped my back out. <laughs> I was so excited. It's the same thing with heaven, folks. It sounds corny and stupid, but it's true. You fight with people, you work with people, and you are a band of people, soldiers. And when that moment is right there in the sky, there's heaven. Do you cower and say, ah, I don't think I 
can get there? Or have you trained yourself? Have you trained those around you to lift you up and say, work harder, run faster? What's the same in the Bible? Soar on the wings of eagles? Sober. And get to heaven. Because I tell you right now, as exhilarated as I was in that moment, getting to heaven will be a billion times better than that. Your life should be your last words. What last words are you leaving behind in our highlighted verse of the day? Galatians 1.10 For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. If today you have been trying to please men, if you've been trying to win friends, you've been trying to win a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife, or you've been trying to say, kids, you know, I want you to be my friend. I don't want you to hate me. No one wants them to hate you. When you're doing things what God says, it'll win out in the end, folks. And the result of a life live well, let's look at this. What's Jesus' last words? He said, it is finished in one section. In another section you see, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So I kind of put them together. <coughs> it is finished. Father, I commit my spirit to you. Something in that order. One of those two orders he said that. Those are both attributed to his last words. But the result of his life after he's given up his, his life, what's it say in Luke 23, 47, right after Jesus died. Now when the centurion saw what happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. A centurion that knew Jesus very little, who watched Jesus die in the pain that he went through in just that moment. We have no record of the centurion knowing anything about Jesus or ever knowing Jesus before. But he watched this man's life even at the very last little bit of it. And he said what? Certainly this man was innocent. You can have the same effect on those around you if your life is your last words. If you are living for God, you will have that effect. When you die, people will not say, hey, they were okay. They'll say, they were the nicest, best, great people I ever met. Because they came to me with love when I had a problem. They did not ever shirk away from things. They told me straight to my face. They were honest with things. They would look me in the eye and say, hey, what are you doing? We love you. Come back to church. Let me help you. They would drive to pick me up for church. They would invite me to church all the time. They loved God. Not only that, I remember my grandfather. I remember my grandmother. I remember my mother, my father. They did not just read a Bible just for fun. They just didn't put it out there and pretend to read. They read the Bible. They read it to us, and they lived that Bible. And yes, they were flawed people. Yes, they made mistakes in life. But you know what? At the end of the day, don't we all make mistakes? And if you're dwelling on a mistake in the past, stop it. Live for God now. Remember that last piece of advice you wrote down earlier? Just five, six words, whatever you wrote. Why aren't you giving this advice out already? And even more, why aren't you living it to its fullest? I'm hoping, knowing you people for as long as I have, for the most part of you, that you wrote something to deal with God. And if you didn't, this isn't a chastisement or anything else, you need to question what's going on in your life. Because the Bible says time and time again, that's why we're here and that's what we're living for. If you got some advice that's just really obscure and it's not even close to God, you need to really find that balance again, don't we? Help each other out. Love each other. And this is the final thing I say to you. Like I said, I love you all. I hope that we all can get to heaven together. And I just don't hope. I'm trying very hard, and I hope you are too. If you need to be baptized, please do not delay. You never know if you have another opportunity. If you need to confess a sin and, and have some help with it, please do not be afraid to do that now. So stand and sing the song. It's been so long.